Hey what's up you guys, welcome back to my channel. Today is going to be a writing advice video, but first you may be wondering why I have my Slytherin hat and my Slytherin scarf on if we're not going to be talking about Harry Potter, and it is because today is unfortunately the anniversary of Alan Rickman's death, so I just wanted to do a quick wands up moment for Professor Snape because he was the best headmaster, so wands up Slytherins, let's have our moment of silence. Alright, so now that we've had our moment of silence, today I wanted to talk about villains and how to write more compelling villain characters. So right now I'm on chapter 8 of my book and in chapter 7 I finally introduced who's going to be the primary antagonist in my story and it got me really thinking about how writers of different genres like film and TV and novels obviously create the villainous character. And so I've been thinking about it now for a couple of days and I really wanted to film a video and talk about things that like I do to create my villains and things that when I read books and I read the villain that is being presented, I just go like, ah, ah, that's shit. So today's video is hopefully going to help you create a three-dimensional realistic villainous character. So let's get started. Okay, so one of the things I hate most is when people make the primary antagonist this one-dimensional mustache twirling, pinky in the brain style, we've got to take over the world today type of character whose only motivation is essentially to do whatever the hero of the story wouldn't do. So essentially a diametrically opposed character, but not necessarily a foil. Let me give you an example. Ah, it's you, nefarious fiend. What dastardly plan have you come up with this time? Ah, yes, it is I, your exact opposite. Today's plan will be destroying the Earth. Wait, what? Yes, I'm going to blow up the planet. Oh, no, 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 I, I just, I wanted to make sure I heard you right the first time, so you're gonna blow up the planet. Yes, it's obvious, isn't it? I'm gonna blow up the planet because you live on it. So you're gonna kill me by blowing up the planet. That's the plan. <laughs> yes, ingenious, isn't it? Yeah, but don't you also live on the planet? <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, so when the planet explodes, you're also going to die. That's the plan. Ah, shit. I didn't think this through. All right, so that may have been an overly dramatic version of uh, a lot of dastardly villainous plans that you see in movies, TV, and books, but my point was that when you have a villain who's diametrically opposed to whatever your hero wants, yes, it creates a conflict, obviously. If your hero is coming in this way and your villain is coming in this way, yeah, they're gonna clash, but it's not like a very interesting clash because you haven't made your villain three-dimensional. Instead, what you've created is just this one-dimensional opposition to your hero, which isn't really any more interesting than watching your hero run into a wall because you haven't given your villain the personality and the motivation to really explain why they're doing what they're doing. So I've heard other writers say that they like to write their villain or at least outline their villain first before starting their story. That way they understand their villain's motivations and can pit their hero against that villain. I personally am not going to talk about that style of creating a villain because I don't have any experience doing that. That's not how I sketch out my villain. So I feel like I'd be a hypocrite if I'm like, yeah, you should totally write the villain first. That's gonna help because I, I don't know if it does, like, let me know because I haven't tried it. So what I like to do when I'm creating my villain is really look at my character um, on a deeper level and delve into it. So what does my character want? What is his or her primary goal in the story? Where are they trying to go? And realistically, who would get in their way on that journey? So the protagonist in my own personal novel is a young prince, but he's not like your stereotypical kind of King Lear style prince or Loki from Thor. He's not in search of the throne. He doesn't want the power. His goal in the story is not to become king. That's not what he was born for. He's like fifth in line for the throne. It's not something that he's had any ambition for in his entire life. So bringing up King Lear, something that comes up a lot when you have like a monarchical story like that is you have two princes vying for power, there's only one throne, and so that just inherently creates conflict. 
But like I said, in my story, my protagonist doesn't want to be king. That's not like his ultimate goal. His goal is really just to be useful for his family and to become a better person and just to be a symbol for the people of his country. So then, what is my antagonist like? So like I said, I just recently introduced my primary antagonist in chapter 7, but I have a secondary antagonist that is essentially the Draco to this Harry, if you will. They're the same age, they're in the same social circle, so to speak, they're in the same family, they're cousins, they're gonna go to the same school. So really, this character is the foil to my protagonist. So whereas my protagonist Phineas really just wants to be a better person and stop being such a spoiled brat and become more humble and a better leader, Holland really leans the other way and he kind of embraces who he is. He's the second in line for the throne behind only his older brother and he has designs for power. He wants to be king. So whereas Phineas is very kind of low key, laid back, humble, just wants to do his thing, Holland is very tightly wound very, very type A, wants to get everything done perfectly on time, do the best he can. He wants the attention, he wants to be king, and Finn just kind of wants to lay back and like let life do its thing. So like I said, Holland's not the primary antagonist of the story. The primary antagonist has just recently been introduced about 100 pages into the story, and she's really in the background. She's not there to be the wall against Phineas as he goes through the story like Holland is. She is laying the groundwork for what is going to be a much more intense confrontation. So like I said, Phineas just wants to do his own thing. He kind of wants to be laid back and he just wants to do good and be a better person and grow up to be like a good man and a noble knight and prince. The overarching theme throughout the entire story is that Phineas needs to grow into his own and be his own person and think for himself and do what he believes is right instead of what everybody tells him he was born to do. So that's where we get the central conflict because where Phineas wants to be independent, he wants to be his own person and not be governed by what destiny and his birthright say he has to do. My primary villain, Mortima, on the other hand, wants to use him. So whereas Phineas is trying to be the Pinocchio who's cutting off his strings, kind of, so to say, I don't think Pinocchio ever had strings, that's entirely irrelevant. But like, think about it, he's a puppet, because he was born into the monarchy, he has a certain role to play, but he doesn't want to do it, he wants to cut his strings. But Mortimer's in the background like, mm-mm, we're not doing that, I have certain designs for you future, so like, stop, stop trying to do your own thing, just do, do, do what I want you to be doing, Phineas, damn. So that is the primary conflict in my story. So it's that lower conflict of two opposing forces, the foils of each other. But then there's the greater conflict of idealism versus doing what everybody wants you to be doing. So there's two different antagonists, I guess. But like I said, I didn't start out writing the villains first. I just looked at who was Phineas. Phineas wants to be humble. He wants to do his own thing. He wants to be separate from his family. He just wants to be his own guy. And so what would oppose that would be people who want to essentially strip Phineas of any ability he has to make his own decisions. So that's how I came up with my villain. Oh, oh god, you're back. Yes, I realized blowing up the earth may have been a bit drastic, so instead, I'm just going to stab you. I'm sorry, so we're stabbing me now? Oh, of course, idiot. I've been set up as your foil this whole time and you don't like stabbing, so therefore... You know, I think you'll find that most people don't like stabbing. I don't think that deciding to go all Jack the Ripper on me makes you my foil. Ah, curses! Ah, foiled again. Yeah, maybe next time try coming up with something that involves a bit of, I don't know, personal character motivation? You know, I just don't know what to do anymore. Whoa, hey, hey! I'm not, I'm not saying you need to change yourself. I'm just saying maybe get some motivation behind your actions. That way, when we finally do clash, you know, it's a real match of wills and spirit and we're both tested as people. No, no, it's all over for me now. You are right. Destroying the planet was a bit drastic and what was I even gonna do with this? I don't even know how to stab somebody. It's over, I'm nothing. So when you're creating a character foil to create an antagonist for your main character, 
What you don't want to do is say, well, because Billy likes purple, Andy, his arch nemesis, must hate purple and vow to crusade for the color pink. That's just really kind of dull and there's no real reason for why Andy would want to crusade for pink other than he just opposes Billy who likes purple. So when you're creating a character foil, you want to think about deeper conflicts that people could have with each other that would make them oppose one another. So one of the things you can think about is optimism versus pessimism is always a go-to in ideology, but you can have an optimist versus a realist. Somebody who's always seeing the bright side of things and is very happy or lucky, energetic, and just wants to see the best in everything around them versus somebody who's just seeing the world for what it is and recognizes that a lot of stuff around them is really shit and tries to bring the optimist down to their more sobered level. So it's not as outright contrary as saying you have one person with the glass half full and another person with the glass half empty, but you have somebody who says, well, the glass is half full, and a second person who says the glass is both half full and half empty. That's the nature of having half a glass of water. So this is probably getting a little long-winded, and I need to get back to writing because chapter eight is really going to be a doozy. So what I'm trying to get across in this ridiculous video is that all of your characters should be three-dimensional. You want to be able to feel for and root for your good guy, but you also want to be able to understand and relate to the motivations of the bad guy. It makes them a bit more multi-layered and a little less mustache twirly. All right, so let's wrap this up. It's been a long video. The point of all of this was for you to understand that your characters, good or bad, need to have relevant, plausible, borderline realistic uh, motivations in order to be doing what they're doing and for the reader to understand and or root for them to accomplish their goals. And if you like what you saw here and you wanna see more videos about writing, reading, on occasion I bake, <laughs> check out more on my channel, go ahead and subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, and leave a comment in the description down below if you're writing a book or if you're having trouble coming up with motivations for your own villain or if you have actually tried this write your villain first method. I'm really curious to see if anybody actually has. As always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you back for my next video.